the previous lesson initiated us to some of the architectures that were built between the 8th and the 18th centuries that is in medieval India. In that lesson we got to learn that these architectures were built to perfection. We also discussed the various characteristics that have helped these buildings or these constructions to stand the ravages of time. And we spent considerable time discussing the architectural finesse of these constructions. But in that lesson our discussion was restricted to understanding how these architectures were pieces of architectures alone. In this lesson we will now try to move beyond this idea to discuss that these architectures were not mere edifices. These architectures simultaneously were symbols of power. But how can architectures be symbols of power? And how can religious places be symbols of power? So let us find out how these religious places were built during the time frame we are considering in our discussion. And along with that we will now try to understand how these religious places were important symbols of power. So let us begin this discussion. Among the various religious places that exist in the Indian subcontinent, for the purpose of our discussion, we will now be focusing on temples and mosques. What are temples and mosques? Temples and mosques are the places of worship of the Hindus and the Muslims respectively. But conventionally, we have this idea that temples and mosques are places of worship alone. That is to say, people gather in these places to offer their prayers to God. But you will be surprised to know that during the medieval period, this was not the only purpose why temples and mosques were constructed by the kings and rulers. Now let us find out why the kings and rulers built temples and mosques and what was the larger idea or the larger reason behind the construction of these religious architectures. Now during the time period we are talking about that is between the 8th and the 18th century, Temples and mosques were not constructed only as places of worship. Instead, these were constructed as a means to demonstrate the power and wealth of the king. Now, going beyond the conventional idea that a temple or a mosque is only a place of worship, the kings or the rulers who ascended the throne at that point of time made these temples and mosques as manifestations of their power, their wealth. Why is it so? To understand this idea, you have to keep in mind that rulers and kings who were ruling at that point of time were very much rooted in their religion. That is to say, they did not give up on their religious affiliation. Now, whenever a king or a sultan ascended the throne, that person made sure that his religion is glorified, that his religion is now spread among the masses, that his religion now gains popularity throughout his territories. And for this purpose, they built their religious architectures that were temples and mosques. But these kings also made these temples and mosques the embodiments of their power. That is to say, when one king is ruling an area, that person will try to portray or demonstrate his power. And how will he try to do so? By building these religious architectures. And these religious architectures were stuffed with wealth. These religious architectures, be that temples or mosques, had huge amounts of resources and wealth stored in them. And this wealth or these resources were in turn the wealth or resources that were in possession of the kings and the rulers. So, these temples and mosques simultaneously with being important places of worship now became embodiment of the power and the wealth of the ruling king. Now, let us find out more about the idea that we are now trying to establish. The point we just raised brings us to the example of the Raja Rajeshwara temple. The Raja Rajeshwara temple was built by King Raja Raja Deva who belonged to the Chola dynasty. Now why do you think King Raja Raja Deva built this Raja Rajeshwara temple? He built this with the purpose of demonstrating his power and he built this temple in the 9th century. What you can see here in this image is the Raja Rajeshwara temple. 
it is huge and magnificent and this one huge and magnificent temple tells you how powerful this ruler was how wealthy this ruler was because without wealth such a magnificent temple cannot be built so this in a lot of way testifies to the power and wealth of the king now let us find out how this raja rajeshwara temple was built by king raja raja deva this raja rajeshwara temple is huge and at the same time it is also very tall it is 162 feet from the ground level can you imagine how tall this temple is now during this time when the kings and rulers were building their mosques forts temples minarets mausoleums they made sure that their architectural pieces were unique that is to say these were extraordinary and no one could replicate them now what did king raja raja deva do to make his raja rajeshwara temple unique for this purpose he built a shikhara now you must be questioning what a shikhara is a shikhara is the topmost part of a temple the very word shikhara means the top or the peak and the shikhara of the raja rajeshwara temple is made of a huge piece of stone and this huge piece of stone weighed 90 tons alone can you imagine how heavy this huge piece of stone must be now when this temple was being constructed technology hadn't advanced cranes weren't available to lift this huge piece of stone to the top of the tower so how did they manage to still build the shikhara for this purpose laborers and craftspersons now built a long ramp or inclined plane and this ramp or inclined plane was of around 6 kilometers and with the help of this ramp now laborers bullocks elephants and horses now rolled the stone to the top of the temple and in this way the shikhara of the raja rajeshwara temple was made now you must be wondering how perfect this one piece of architecture is that is how perfect the raja rajeshwara temple is previously we have learned that king raja raja deva had built this raja rajeshwara temple to demonstrate his power but to understand this in greater detail we will also have to take into account why this temple was built in the first place the main deity in the raja rajeshwara temple is the god raja rajeshwaram can you find any similarity between the name of the king that is raja raja deva and raja rajeshwaram by building this temple that is by building the raja rajeshwara temple King Raja Raja Deva wanted to portray himself as the God. Now in this way he tried to ascribe to himself a divine status. The king is equivalent to the God and for this purpose the Raja Rajeshwara temple was made. So to put it simply Raja Raja Deva took the name of the God Raja Rajeshwara to appear like God and in this way he portrayed himself of equal status to that of the deity. So the deity that was being worshipped in the temple was equivalent to King Raja Raja Deva. He had power, he had wealth equal to that of the deity. So can you understand during that period how the kings wanted to portray themselves as God? They wanted to attribute to themselves a divine status. They wanted to show that they were manifestations of the God. And for this reason temples were made by the kings. And one such instance was the construction of the Raja Rajeshwara temple. Now in a court or in fact in the larger world we see a hierarchy. A hierarchy in the sense of the term that there is the king at the top of the power. And then come his subordinates, his nobles, his subjects. Now when the kings were constructing their temples they wanted to make a miniature model of the world. So a miniature model of the world that was ruled by the king and his allies were made in the temple. Now how was this implemented within the space of a temple? We have to keep in mind that the largest of temples were constructed by the kings. And the main deity that was worshipped in the temple was always the deity of the king alone. So the deity that the king worshipped became the main deity in the temple also. And the lesser deities that were worshipped by his allies and subordinates 
became the lesser deities of the temple. So, you can see how this hierarchy was in play even inside the temple. The main deity was the god of the king and the lesser deities were the gods and goddesses of the rulers, allies and subordinates. And in this way, the temple was a miniature model of the world. Now with this, you can infer that the king also wanted to showcase himself as the god of the temple. So you can see that the king who sat at the helm of his empire or his kingdom was equivalent in power to the god who was at the center of a temple. So the king wanted to portray his omnipotence. There was no one beyond the king. And in the same way, in a temple, the main deity was omnipotent. There was no one beyond the main deity in a temple. So in this way, the kings now wanted to portray themselves as equal to the God. Now we have learned that the largest of temples were constructed by the kings and the deity of the king was worshipped as the main or the largest deity in the temple and the lesser deities in the temples were the gods and goddesses of his subordinates and allies and together this meant a just rule of God on earth. Why is it so? Because you have to understand that the kings want to show themselves as divinely ordained. That is to say, the rule of a king has been ordained by God. The rule of a king has been brought into place by God only. The king was equal in power, equal in strength with God. And when this king, when this benevolent king was ruling an area, it inevitably meant that just rule was prevailing in that area. So in this way, kings were now equal to gods. Kings now wanted to portray themselves with a divine status. So we began this lesson with a discussion on how religious places can be symbols of power. And from this, we now are trying to understand how the kings wanted to portray themselves as equal to God. How the kings wanted to ascribe to themselves a divine status. How they wanted to show that they were beyond all the men in the kingdom. What we have been discussing all this while has been with regard to the Hindu rulers and how these Hindu rulers built their own temples. But a similar kind of obsession with showing oneself as equivalent to God could be seen among the Muslim sultans as well. Now Muslim sultans made or constructed mosques and these mosques were places where people went to offer their prayer to God. So the Muslim sultans built mosques to offer their prayers to God. But in some cases we have seen that the sultans did not believe in the incarnations of God but they still built mosques they built mosques only to show their importance only to portray their importance only to reinstate their authority now why do you think that the sultans who did not believe in the incarnations of God still build mosques which were places of worship this is because by building mosques they wanted to show their importance to the world they wanted to reinstate their authority. They wanted to establish their supremacy by the construction of mosques. And you can also see a similar pattern in the case of Sultan Balban. Sultan Balban was a sultan who belonged to the slave or Mamluk dynasty. Now a while ago we were discussing King Raja Rajadeva and how he built the Raja Rajeshwara temple to portray himself as equivalent to God. And in a similar way, Balban also showcased himself or called himself the shadow of God. Now from where do we get this information? Persian chronicles describe Balban as the shadow of God. That is to say we find a similar pattern in Balban's rule as well. He wanted to show himself or he wanted to portray himself as equivalent to God. Which is why he called himself a shadow of God. A shadow of God as in he was a divine manifestation. So we see a similar idea between King Raja Rajadeva and Balban on the other hand. 
Now before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question quickly. Which ruler was called the shadow of God? Was it Raja Raja Chola, Balban, Alauddin Khalji or Timur? Yes, you are right. It was Balban and we get to know this from Persian chronicles that describe Balban as the shadow of God. But this desire or this aspiration to portray oneself as equivalent to God wasn't exclusive to King Raja Raja Deva or Balban because we find a similar idea in the rule of Alauddin Khalji as well. Now Alauddin Khalji was a Sultan of the Khalji dynasty that ruled under the Delhi Sultanate and in an inscription that we find in the Kuwait al Islam mosque. Now you must remember who made this Kuwait al Islam mosque. It was the Mamluk or the slave Sultan Qutbuddin Aibak who started the construction of the Kuwait al Islam mosque and in an inscription that we find in the Kuwait al Islam mosque we get to know that God chose Alauddin Khalji who ruled from 1296 to 1316 as a king because he had the qualities of Moses and Solomon. Now Moses and Solomon are biblical figures and they are known as the greatest lawgivers of the past. And from this inscription we get to learn that Alauddin Khalji also called himself a chosen one of the God because he believed that he possessed the qualities of Moses and Solomon. Now the greatest lawgiver of the land is God. It is God who built the world out of chaos and disruption and it is God who introduced harmony in the world. So by portraying himself as equal to God, Alauddin Khalji wanted to mean that he was also one of the greatest lawgivers of the land. And what does this mean? This also means that Alauddin Khalji as a sultan was omnipotent. All the people who were being ruled by him were supposed to obey him. His say or his words were at the top of everything and no one could refute his ideas. It was Alauddin Khalji who was divinely ordained as the sultan of the Khalji dynasty and the people who were living under his rule or his subjects were meant to obey his orders and commands. Now the medieval period has been a time of constant change because one dynasty was replaced by another. Kings were clashing and fighting and by defeating one king, another king or another ruler now ascended the throne. Now in this period of constant flux, the rulers required to reassert their authority. Now how did they do so? For this reason, rulers of every new dynasty that came to power constructed places of worship. And why were these places of worship made? These places of worship were meant to assert their moral rights to be rulers. Now while talking about Sultan Alauddin Khalji, we get to know that he considered himself divinely ordained. And this also justifies or speaks to his moral rights to be a ruler. That is to say, he had the moral right to be a ruler. It was his rule that was legitimized and sanctioned by the gods. So whenever any new ruler came to power and founded any dynasty, that person made sure that he made a lot of places of worship. Now as these rulers were divinely ordained, they were also benevolent. Because God will not choose a malefic ruler to rule over his people. So for this reason it was assumed that these rulers or these kings who were divinely ordained were very just and benevolent. And a just or a benevolent ruler's rule also meant something good for the land, something good for his subjects. So whenever any just ruler was ruling the lands, the heavens were also happy, which is why it always rained sufficiently. There wasn't any scarcity of water. So because of the rule of a just ruler, the heavens rained upon them and with rain grew new crops and with crops came prosperity. So can you understand how these ideas are all linked together? You have a just ruler who is divinely ordained and that just ruler will in turn please the heavens 
and since heavens are pleased rains will come rains will make the land fertile fertile land means lots of crops lots of crops means fertility and prosperity to the kingdom so this was a whole chain of ideas that the rulers believed in and that the rulers stated while they were ruling and trying to assert their moral authority their moral supremacy over the people they were ruling water is the most essential thing that we need for our survival without water you and i and no one can survive so water is the most essential thing that we require in our everyday lives now the rulers during this period were very wise they knew that they had to do something to make clean proper water accessible to all the people and this in turn would bring him praise and credit now what did the kings and rulers think of doing for this purpose the rulers now constructed reservoirs and water tanks and by constructing reservoirs and water tanks the people were very pleased because the subjects or the various people who were living in those kingdoms and those territories got access to water which is why the kings and rulers now started gaining praise these kings and rulers were being celebrated for making water this basic resource of water accessible to all the people in the lands and in a similar way sultan iltutmish also constructed a large reservoir this large reservoir was constructed outside delhi ikona which is the old city of delhi and this large reservoir is known as the hauz sultani or the king's reservoir and this reservoir was built in the year 1230 now while constructing this huge reservoir that is known as the hauz sultani Iltutmish knew that he would now gain universal popularity because the construction of this one large reservoir brought him great acclaim and praise as their sultan. Since water is so important, tanks and reservoirs were also made within the religious places, and we can see instances of this in the tanks or reservoirs that were made in the Jami Masjid. or the golden temple in this image you can see the jami masjid and here is a small tank that stored water and at the same time you can see the golden temple and this golden temple is surrounded on all sides by a huge sarovar this sarovar is considered the holy water that surrounds this golden temple which is a prayer place or a place of worship of the sikhs so tanks and reservoirs were not made only outside the temples but inside temples and mosques as in in jami masjid or golden temple also we can see tanks and reservoirs now all this while the most important point that we have been trying to establish is that the kings made their temples and mosques as manifestations as embodiments of their power and wealth now since these temples now became the embodiments of the power and wealth of the kings these places these religious places now became the target of the enemies because the enemies knew that if they can attack the religious places religious places as in the temples or mosques they will be able to demolish or attack the power and the wealth of the king because it was this one temple it was this one mosque that meant or that stood as a manifestation or a demonstration of the king's wealth and power the king had invested all his wealth a huge amount of his resources a great amount of his power in constructing these temples and mosques and the enemies knew that if they can attack these temples and mosques they will in turn be able to attack the power and wealth of the kings Now here we see an instance of the point that we are now trying to establish. A Buddhist chronicler by the name of Dhamma Kitti gives us this information. In one of his chronicles, he stated that a Pandyan king by the name of Shrimada Shrivallava had invaded Lambakanna. Lambakanna was the then name of Sri Lanka, 
and in this process of invading Lambakanna, Srimada Srivallava had defeated the king Sena the first. So Sena the first was at that time the king or ruler of Lambakanna, and Srimada Srivallava had defeated him. Now, when did this invasion of Lambakanna happen? It happened in the early 9th century. Now, why did this invasion of Lambakanna happen? That is to say, why did Srimada Srivallava suddenly invade Lambakanna? Let us find this out. So, with this, we now have to understand why Srivallava or this Pandyan king invaded Lambakanna. Now, this was a classic case or a classic instance of loot and plunder. Srivallava removed all valuables, including the statue of Buddha that was made entirely of gold in order to showcase his victory over the defeated king. So, while he invaded Lambakanna, he looted and plundered all the resources, all the wealth of that kingdom and he brought back all those resources to his own kingdom. And in this process, he also removed the very valuable statue of Buddha that is made entirely of gold. Now, why did he do this? He did this in order to showcase his power. Because he had the power, he had the strength, he had the courage to invade another territory. And by invading another territory and defeating the ruler there, he was able to remove all the valuables from this place. So, this was a case of loot and plunder. That is to say, a ruler looted an area and plundered all the resources that were available there. Now, during the medieval period, loot and plunder was very, very prevalent because most of the kings gathered their resources by looting and plundering other areas, by looting and plundering the resources of other kings and rulers. Now, let us find out more about this case. Now, we have learned that Srivallava or this Pandyan king wanted to portray himself as very powerful and in order to showcase his victory, his pride over the defeated king, he removed all the valuables from Lambakanna or Sri Lanka. Now, do you think the people of Lambakanna were ready to absorb this humiliation? No. Why would they do so? Because this was a foreign invader on their land and in order to avenge this blow to the pride of the Sinhalis ruler. Now, for this, keep in mind that Sri Lanka is known by different names. At that time, Sri Lanka was known as Lambakanna. In fact, Sri Lanka is also known as Sinhal. So, the defeat of the Sinhalis ruler, that is King Sena I, was then avenged by the next ruler, that was King Sena II. Now, King Sena II, ordered his general to invade the Pandyan capital Madurai. Here is Madurai, which was the capital of the Pandyan kingdom. King Srimada Srivallava was a ruler of Madurai and the Pandyan kingdom. And he had invaded Sri Lanka or Lambakanna. He looted all the resources, all the valuables from Lambakanna and took those back to Madurai. And in order to avenge this defeat, in order to avenge this blow to the pride of the Sinhalis ruler, his next ruler or his successor, King Sena II, now ordered his troops to invade the Pandyal capital of Madurai. From the map we just saw, we could understand that Sri Lanka or Lambakanna is located very close to India and the Pandyan capital Madurai. Now, the expedition that King Sena II embarked upon was meant to restore this gold statue of Buddha. This gold statue of Buddha was very valuable to Lambakanna. And while King Sena II now invaded Madurai, he made sure that he could restore the gold statue of Buddha. Now, what we were trying to understand brings us to the concept of loot and plunder. Now, you have to keep this in mind that loot and plunder weren't very new things during the medieval period. In fact, most of the kings gathered their resources by looting and plundering the resources of other kings. And when we talk about looting and plundering, mention needs to be made of 
Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni. That is to say, a discussion on looting and plundering will remain incomplete without discussing Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni's raids on the Indian subcontinent. Now, why did he start or embark upon raiding expeditions to the Indian subcontinent? This is because he was attracted to the huge amount of gold and resources and wealth that the Indian kings and rulers had. And you will be surprised to know that Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni had invaded India for 17 times. So he laid 17 raiding expeditions on the Indian subcontinent. And in this process, he had destroyed a lot of Hindu temples. Now we have to understand that Mahmud of Ghazni's raids also had a religious dimension because he had committed himself to destroying all the Hindu temples. And in this process of destroying the Hindu temples, he had also attacked the Somnath temple of Gujarat. The Somnath temple of Gujarat is a very holy religious place of the Hindus. And Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni also laid raiding expeditions on the Somnath temple. King Mahmud of Ghazni, prior to these expeditions on the Indian subcontinent, Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni wasn't very popular. He was a Sultan of Ghazni in Afghanistan and he raided India 17 times. And through these 17 expeditions on the Indian subcontinent, he completely looted and plundered this country. And while he did so, he now gained popularity and importance. He was able to carry back a lot of resources of the Indian kings and rulers back to Afghanistan. And while he destroyed the Hindu temples, he also earned the credit of being a great hero of Islam. So you can understand how religion played a major role in Mahmud of Ghazni's raids in the Indian subcontinent because he wanted to show himself as a protector or a great hero of Islam. He wanted to establish the supremacy of Islam over Hinduism, which is why he destroyed the Hindu temples, one of which temple was the Somna temple of Gujarat. So in this lesson, we got to understand how religious places served different purposes along with being places of worship during the medieval period. We got to learn that these were symbols of power of the kings who made them. We also learned that by building temples and mosques, the sultans or the kings wanted to show themselves as equivalent to God. We also learned that the defeat or the attack on a religious place meant an attack or the defeat of a king. So with this, we come to an end of our discussion on religious places as symbols of power. But firstly, we had begun this series of lessons by trying to understanding the rulers and their architectural pieces. And while we take into account the various architectural pieces that were made in India between the 8th and the 18th centuries, special mention needs to be made of the rulers of one mighty empire. And it is the architecture of this mighty empire that we will be dealing with in our subsequent lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.